Well, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our weekly webinars live with Dr. McDougall. I'm Gustavo Tolosa, the webinar coordinator for Dr. McDougall. And uh, this is our last webinar for 2015. I can't believe we started way back in May and uh, thought we were going to do a few. And here we are in December and we're here to stay. And we hope that this year has been great for all of you and that uh, the new year is going to be full of uh, uh, many good things, especially good health. Um, I want to uh, take a few, just a minute, if Dr. McDougall will allow me. Well, I have the camera, so I, now I have the power. So Dr. McDougall, I want to just um, thank you for being here every week and giving your time. And I know that a lot of people that are logged in here. You have uh, really made a huge difference in their lives. You have made a difference in my life. I don't, I would be in very, very bad shape um, if I had not found you about two years ago. And I want to thank you. I want to ask people actually to write a few messages on the chat box about, um, uh, well, what, what this has meant to you and what Dr. McDougall has done for you. I would like to see that. And um, so thank you. And Dr. McDougall, uh, I want to welcome you today to the last webinar of 2015. And you're going to be talking about food sex and attractiveness which is a very good topic and um thank you again here you go well that's good are we going to be uh, showing a little movie at the end or at the beginning um i just want you to say to welcome people and then i'm going to show a oh, very short show, yeah. clip it's it's been it's been a growing year is what it's been gustavo with you and i learning how to do this and to make <laughs> make it work reliably but uh I can't tell you how many comments, and what I'm trying to say, I get many comments personally as well as over the uh, email about how much people appreciate the webinar. We certainly enjoy doing it, and uh, uh, for me to be able to sit here in my studio and to talk to hundreds and sometimes thousands of people as opposed to getting on an airplane or even driving my car down uh, down to the library to give, to give you a talk, this is just a miraculous invention. And uh, if uh, it really, you need to know this, I say it all the time, it's Gustavo that uh, pushed me into doing this. And uh, we have, a, yes, you do, yes, you did. <laughs> it would never happen with, without you. And we've got a real show going and we're gonna keep getting better. And we're adding new people. You must know some of our other experts like Doug Lyle will be coming on. It's a possibility my son, uh, Craig McDougall will be doing a uh, webinar presentation and some of our other staff to bring other aspects of our program to you out there wherever you're living. So we're going upward and forward. We're really excited about it. Uh, I don't think I can run out of things to talk about. No, no, that's not possible. It's been 40 years. <laughs> um, so Dr. McDougall, I would like to um, pl uh, play uh, about a two minute video from way back and uh, everybody, I haven't told Dr. McDougall which uh, video I'm playing, so it's a little surprise. <laughs> but I, um, Dr. McDougall, I chose this one because I think this would be a good uh, thing for all of us to consider as we start the new year. And after the clip is done, I would like for you to comment a few words about this, this clip. All right? Okay. Sure. So, okay, here we go. And this is the, the little clip, two minutes. my father-in-law in his garden. He's having such a great time. It looks like he's getting a lot of exercise. He's singing, enjoying himself. You know, he spends so much time in the garden. Why do you spend so much time out here? It's good exercise. You have such beautiful plants. They seem to grow so strong. How do you get them to uh, grow so nicely? What kind of fertilizers do you use? Compost and natural manures. And I notice there aren't any bugs in any of your plants here. How do you keep the bugs away? Certain flowers, most flowers, attract certain kind of bugs that kill the bad bugs. I see. So it's kind of a balance. Balance. Natural balance. You know, you got, I'm sure, a lot of problems at home and at work. Uh, what do you think about when you come out in the garden? Oh, just relax with everything. You forget everything. All your problems. Just think about your plants? Just think about plants. You know, I hear you singing out here, too, and I hear you singing uh, religious songs. 
Well, back to nature and what God has made. Does that help you relax too? You bet. Most people talk about gardening as a hobby. It's much, much more physical than that. I mean, people are up and down, they stretch muscles, they have to lift things. You burn almost 200 calories an hour when you garden. This is a sport. Dad, how old are you? 76. 76 years old and a gardener. You could look like that if you gardened when you're 76. I bet even I could. Any time of the year is a good time to start thinking about gardening. Now, why don't you go out in your yard and find that spot where you're going to relax, where you're going to get your exercise, the place you're going to start that special garden, and pretty soon you'll be reaping the fruits of your labor. I want to do it. I want to have a garden. <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty cool. That's my uh, that's my wife's dad, Pat Like. Yeah, he, oh, he, I he, didn't he was know a that. good friend, a uh, very good friend of mine. I to enjoy. I would guess uh, 33 years of my life with him. Uh, he, we did everything together. We sailed boats together. We flew airplanes together. We gardened together. And we did this TV show often together. He'd be a guest. It was called, it's still playing, Lifestyle Magazine. It's a TV show I've done for over 35 years. And he'd be, of course, one of the characters. And one time we took him to the, uh, we'll show that one later on, to the, to the mud baths up in Calistoga. And, and this is him talking about uh, about nature and about God. He was a very religious man. And uh, I'm, I'm glad you picked that one. I, I enjoyed that one also very much. Uh, the man was very strong. He almost died of uh, <coughs> heart disease at age 70, and I found prostate cancer on him. Dr. Well, Mandubal, your, your sound is um, it's off. There's a lot of static. I wonder mm -hmm. if there's something near you, like a phone or something, that is preventing the sound from coming All right, coming let's, let's, see if we, let's see if we can make it work okay. better. I can that, even take that is already... That's all, Better? Yeah, that's already better. Yes. All right. Yes. Well, if it starts again, we stop me. About, I, we missed a few words. Yeah, okay. Well, what I wanted you to know is uh, he was a man of great strength. He had a heart attack at 70, wouldn't change his diet. And uh, then he had another heart attack about six months later, and at that time he changed his diet. When he was about 65 years old, I found prostate cancer on his prostate. through. I used to do his physical examinations. And he asked me what to do, and I said, you should do nothing. And they were people of great faith, uh, he and Marge. And they believed in me, and they said, okay, we'll do nothing. Well, he eventually died at 93 years old uh, of natural causes. And uh, never had another heart attack. He uh, worked right up until the day he died. So he, he, he wow. did well. He's a great example of what a diet can do for you, even when you start old. And he was uh, 70 years old before he changed. I'm it's never sure that. too late, really, to change, right? It's never too late to change. And the, and the results are absolutely phenomenal. <clears throat> that was a nice one. You pick and surprise me every time. Let me uh, get uh, to going on the, sh on the show today. I want to talk to you about... All right, very about good. Looking good. I know you yeah. have a PowerPoint presentation, so I while see. you're... Uh, okay, there, there it is. It's set. you see it? You see uh, the we can see it. Perfect. All right, good. Well, this is from uh, the November 2015 newsletter, the current newsletter, and the second part will come out in December 2015 because I we are, are not going to do any webinars for the next two weeks, and the newsletter will be out. You'll be seeing some of that newsletter uh, before it gets published at the end of December. The newsletter, in part to get, people, get people's attention, is titled Food, Sex, and Attractiveness. Uh, <clears throat> attractiveness. Attractiveness serves to get people together. Yeah. You want to be attractive because you want the best quality of people around you. When we're talking about intimate relationships of uh, sexual reproduction, a man wants to share his sperm with the healthiest person he can find, and the woman wants to share her ovary with the healthiest person she can find so they can produce the uh, most successful and fittest offspring. It's just natural. It's just about survival. So when you look, think about attractiveness, the first thing you might think about is the cliff in a man's chin or 
the shape of a woman's nose, but that's not what you're looking at. What you're looking at are signs, clues uh, called attractiveness that will help you uh, have the, the best mate possible. And this isn't just about sexual reproduction and attractiveness. It's also in your workplace. You want to work with people that are healthy. Uh, then that comes across as uh, you calling it attractive. You want healthy people around you who can work long hours, are skilled, and you see those as clues of attractiveness. Uh, people who are, are, are healthy, which translates into attractiveness, uh, get higher paying jobs. They're more likely to get into college. They're just more likely to be successful. So <clears throat> let's look at various act, uh, areas of attractiveness. And again, these go beyond just sexual reproduction. Uh, <clears throat> Vegetarians, vegans have 13% more testosterone than do meat eaters. And that comes from a study you can see up there, the British Journal of Cancer, 13% more testosterone. And people who eat healthy have less erectile dysfunction because erectile dysfunction is caused, well, by feeling poorly. It's also caused, and the main cause is vascular. Uh, the penis becomes erect when it gets filled. The penis is a sponge-like organ. It gets filled with blood. You have to have good blood circulation to get that penis erect. And uh, erectile dysfunction is directly tied to heart disease. People, in fact, it's a predictor as to whether or not you're gonna have a heart attack because you're dealing with the same cardiovascular system that supplies the heart, the brain, and the penis. So eating well makes you sexually more powerful, functional, and attractive. <clears throat> Underweight and overweight uh, reduces the chances of a woman being, becoming pregnant. Uh, in one study on uh, protein intake and ovulatory infertility, they found that replacing animal sources of protein with vegetable sources of protein may reduce ovulatory infertility. In other words, if a woman eats a healthy diet, she's more likely to get pregnant. If a man eats a healthy diet, he'll have higher testosterone le levels and less chance of erectile dysfunction. They'll have a better chance of performing uh, their family duties. Diet will make that difference. And attractiveness gives you clues that that's what's going to happen. Environmental chemicals, about almost 89 to 99% of our body's environmental chemicals come from meat, dairy, and other foods, fish, chickens, foods high in the food chain. And these environmental uh, chemicals have a big impact on your reproductive outcomes. Uh, environmental chemicals are a primary cause of birth defects. They interfere with testosterone function. This is, a, this is one I particularly found interesting. They decreased ejaculate volume. Now, you may not pay attention to ejaculate volume much, but then again, you may. And it, when the chemicals you take, it results in a decreased ejaculate volume, which has all kinds of ramifications. Uh, it causes low sperm count. It shortens sperm life. You have poor sperm mortality genetic damage and infertility because of these chemicals that come primarily from eating the animal foods, including fish. Now a mother, when she con <clears throat> consumes a diet high on the food chain, animal foods, uh, these chemicals in her body that she gets from the environment, they influence the male fetus, the little baby living inside of her. And when you're on that kind of diet, it increases the risk of the boy baby to be born to have a smaller penis and smaller testicles. Also those chemicals cause the, uh, the opening, the urethra to open not at the tip of the penis where it's supposed to, but at the base of the penis and that's called hypospadia. Hypospadia is a very serious uh, genital, genital uh, defect that occurs in, in children and it's caused by environmental chemicals. Also, an undescended te testicle is another a cause from these environmental chemicals. <clears throat> Going 
away from the chemicals again, just going back to the basic foods. If a man or woman <clears throat> eats fewer plants, they have an increased risk of birth de defects. This is irrespective of, of chemicals. And one of the one of the birth defects that's so, so commonly caused by a diet insufficient in folate, folate is foliage, it's from plants, is uh, uh, Down syndrome. It damages the male sperm. So the male passes on genetically trisomy uh, gene pattern, trisomy 21 gene pattern. He passes that through his sperm onto the female <clears throat> and the result can be Down syndrome, just from eating less plants. All right, let's take a talk about some of the clues to attractiveness. Uh, body weight is a clue to attractiveness. Being too thin or too fat <clears throat> is unattractive. And it's also a sign of poor health. In between, there are all kinds of levels of plumpness that people have found themselves attracted to. Uh, you remember the pictures you've seen in the museums of uh, the ladies of the day. And often <clears throat> an attractive woman would be a woman who was uh, plump in size. Kind of depends on the area that you live in and what you particularly care for. But you must be within a range <clears throat> that's not too little, not too trim, not too little fat, and not too much fat. You've got to be in a, a range that is uh, conducive to reproductivity so that you can have babies in a family. Uh, too little fat on a mother will result in infertility and low birth weight, high risk babies. Now too much fats associated with infertility, poor birth outcomes, and overweight women grow overweight babies. Now the birth canal is designed for a five to six pound baby. And that's the size babies used to be when I was a baby. And they used to fit out easily. These days, because mother's eating so much food, the babies are growing to eight, 10, 12, sometimes 14 pounds. And they can't fit out of a birth canal that was designed for a six pound baby. They just don't go. So as a result, you have to take the baby out from the top. That's cesarean sections. Often, in fact, uh, 30 to 40% of births in our society are cesarean sections. In parts of the world, like in uh, <clears throat> Argentina, in Buenos Aires, uh, in the wealthy families, uh, as many as 80% of the births are some, from cesarean sections. Well, if you try and have the baby born through the birth canal, because the baby's so big, the baby gets injured. And the mother and the baby have a higher risk of death if you're dealing with an overweight mother. Uh, Walter Kempner uh, was one of my heroes. Uh, he was my most important medical doctor hero, and he treated a lot of problems, including eye disease and kidney disease and arthritis and high blood pressure, just horrible problems with something called the rice diet. And he put in his book, here's some of the patients he treated with rice and sugar and fruit and fruit juice, that's the diet. Morbidly obese people he treated. But in his book, and I uh, wanted to re reproduce the chart for you, Walter Kempner had a weight chart. You're always asking for weight charts. Walter Kempner put in a weight chart, and it's the weight you should be fully dressed in pounds for men and for women. Now, I know you're trying to look at that really hard and see where you fit in, so I'll do it for women. There, you can look at the women, see your height and your weight. Okay, you got it all thought out there where you fit, and here it is for men. Now, I am six foot tall. I am 150 pounds or less. So I guess I'd be a little underweight according to Walter Kemper. Maybe with all my clothes on, heavy shoes and a coat, I would hit Walter Kemper's 160 pounds. I think that's a reasonable weight. If you put any of my staff or family to these figures, they will all weigh within these figures. The reason I put this chart in one of my uh, previous newsletters is because when people follow the diet I recommend, uh, they often are told that they are too thin or they think that they're too thin. Uh, it's it's just, about, just a matter of perception, really. And so I send them to the Walter Kempner weight charts 
<clears throat> so that they can see that they're really not too thin. This is what a person should weigh. And uh, if you follow the diet strictly as I teach, even the McDougall diet, you will get close to Kempner's figures on what is ideal weight. Now, I do have to add, Walter Kempner said sick people, people with diabetes and heart disease and kidney disease, should weigh 10 to 15% less than the figures you're looking at. This is just for normal, healthy people. So what is the ideal weight for you to be most attractive? Well, I kind of like the Kempner figures. You may have some other idea of what's attractive. It just has to be within a range where you can reproduce successfully. Now, I want to show you another area of attractiveness. That has to do with the pallor or pinkness or grayness of your skin. This is your circulation. Uh, oxygen makes the blood turn red. And if you have a lot of oxygenated blood in your skin, you'll be termed in the pink because you'll have a nice pink, rosy complexion. Even dark-skinned people, you can see this. As the uh, blood goes through the blood vessels, the oxygen is taken out. And at a certain point, you enter the venous system where the blood is blue. And you know the difference from cutting yourself, whether or not you are bleeding blue blood or red blood. Well, the more blue blood you have in the skin, the more bluish or grayish you'll look. The more red blood you have in the skin, the more reddish or in the pink you will look. If you don't have very much blood at all in the skin, in other words, the vessels have shut down, you will have pallor, a grayish pallor. Now, let me show you how what you eat changes the color of your skin. You want to be in the pink. You want to, look, you know, people pink up. They're the same. They they look have a nice glow to them. The flow in your, in your blood vessel system changes with what you eat. <clears throat> this is the effect of fat and oil on your skin, on your blood vessels. You see those individual discs there? Those are blood cells. That's prior to a meal. Those blood cells, they hit and they bounce off each other. They have a negative uh, repellent nature to themselves so that they don't stick together. They hit, repel. You feed fat. This is animal fat or vegetable fat. What happens is the cells get coated with fat. And now they no longer repel, they start to stick together in clumps and the circulation shows. If you look at the uh, picture in the bottom left-hand corner, it is uh, the blood is so stuck together, we have a term for that, that's called rouleau formation. Or actually it's the next one over. You see those discs that are kind of stacked on, it's like, maybe it came from, comes from a French word, roulette, roulette, roulette table, so, you know, roulette table. That's, I never thought of it. Maybe that's kind of the, the, the uh, uh, chips that you play with all stacked up. But anyway, they call it rouleau formation. And that, that occurs very severely four to six hours after you eat fat, vegetable fat or animal fat. And then maybe 10 to 12 hours later, this all starts to break up and then you have normal circulation. During this period of time, if you measure the arterial blood in the system, the amount of oxygen in the blood drops 20%. So remember, you have less oxygenated blood, you're more blue in color, and when the blood just doesn't flow at all, you get a grayish pallor. All right, now I want you to watch this. This is a video that shows the exact same thing of change in circulation when you eat vegetable fat or animal fat, and I do want you to note, and I'll say it again, vegetable fat causes the blood to to sludge more severely and last longer than does animal fat. Now here's the blood flowing uh, very quickly, the blood cells repelling each other, no food fed. See the nice circulation, good oxygen content, nice good flow here. These are blood discs, blood, blood vessel cells, red blood cells primarily. And then you feed the fat and you see that the fat coats the cells, <clears throat> they stick together and sludge. Uh, some of the places they've actually stopped the flow of blood, this blood becomes deoxygenated and blue in color. And this sludging continues. You see the sludge, you see the rouleau formation there. You see areas that there's no more blood through, flowing through the capillaries. They're completely blocked up. So that's pallor, gray and pallor when it's in your skin. And uh, finally, after about 10 hours, the, uh, the sludge, sludging disappears and circulation returns. Now, this is a, the exact same experiment done on people, almost the exact same experiment. This was done by Meyer Friedman. 
and uh, published in 1964. What he did is he took, in this case, a 44-year-old fireman and laid him out down on a table and he put a microscope over the white of his eye, the conjunctiva. You know, when you open your eye in the morning, you see that white area with red blood vessels over the top. So he set this microscope up uh, over the conjunctiva of the eye and on the left picture, you see a conjunctiva or of the eye that has thick blood vessels, many, many blood vessels. What they did next is they asked this 44-year-old fireman to eat a meal that contains 67% of the calories as fat. This was the meal, two eggs, four strips of bacon, milk, cream, bread, and two pats of butter. Have you ever eaten that? Well, if you look at the next frame over, that's his eye four hours later. <clears throat> and you can actually see blood vessels that have disappeared. And the blood sludges through there and it becomes a more bluish color. And when the vessels disappear, that's pallor if it was in your skin. So a, uh, a look in the skin of being uh, pale, gray, blue, is unattractive. It's giving you a signal that this is not a healthy person. This is not a, the person you want to work with or, or uh, breed with. That's another clue, is the pallor of the skin. And of course, if you stop doing that, you stop eating the fats and oils, then you will pink up. You'll be in the pink and people will be more attracted to you. Uh, let's talk about diet and acne. The foods to avoid are animal foods, especially dairy, vegetable oils, vegan packaged foods, they're full of oil, nuts and seeds and avocados. And what you wanna eat are starches, vegetables, and fruits. These oils that you eat go someplace. They go under your skin as stored body fat, and they also go on your skin and you end up having greasy skin. Greasy skin and greasy hair is unattractive. If you're tired of looking greasy, just stop eating these things as well as the meats and the vegetable oils and the fake vegan foods and nuts and seeds and avocados. Stop eating that stuff. And then the oil goes away and then the acne goes away. <clears throat> these are pictures that you may see on national television soon. These are the Nelson twins, Jeff Nelson's girls. And uh, you see the terrible acne they have. Uh, <clears throat> Rhonda and Nina are uh, professional actresses. And uh, their downfall had been the consumption of vegetable oils and uh, vegan cheesecakes and other kinds of vegan foods. So they figured this out. I'd been telling them this for a while. And also their uh, son, their brother was in the same situation. Mm -hmm. And he came to one of our weekends to help film one of our weekends. And I told him this, I said, look, this is the problem. It's the oil on your skin leads to acne. Well, they were in a vacation situation where the oily vegan food became even more intense. And that's what happened to their faces. And uh, right then and there, they decided they were gonna go back to a starch-based diet and get the oil out of their diet. <clears throat> and uh, here they are now. And they're gonna go, a, uh, they, uh, I've had um, some of the big TV shows call me and ask if they would do a show and, and me be present. I don't think I'll travel to their studio, but I may be present. So you see all these kids, mostly kids, teenagers, suffering terribly. I mean, just terrible child abuse going on with uh, greasy skin, greasy hair, and acne, and even happens in adults. And it's a simple solution. You cut the animal foods, particularly the dairy, and you get the oil out of the diet, and the face heals up. And you know, it's, I, I see my patients become non-greasy usually within four days of being at the program, and they notice it. It'll probably take a month to heal up the, the sores. Now, attractiveness. Remember, we're talking about attractiveness. In addition to sight, you share your health and thereby your attractiveness through smell. <clears throat> uh, smells are made by chemicals that are in the air, and these chemicals go in the nose, in the nasal cavity, and they're attached to little hairs. We call them hairs, but they're really tiny nerves. And the nerves interact with the chemicals, and then the nerves, if you can see the olfactory lobe there, that's the stalk of the brain. The nerves go through the stalk of the brain, the olfactory lobe, up into an area of the brain called the limbic system, which is uh, kind of that uh, bean-shaped system there. You can see the red lines taking it in, into that. That central uh, area of the brain, it's called uh, the limbic system, 
with the hypothalamus. And that's the area of the brain where, uh, where messages of sex and love and smell and desire, that's where they're processed. So you know this, the perfume industry and the deodorant industry tries to sell you bottles of love to give you a good smell. Good smells, desirable smells are attractive. Bad smells are unattractive. Now the primary bad smell that people run into is uh, sulfur. And the way we get sulfur, because sulfur is neither created or destroyed, it's a basic element. You must take it into the body. And the sulfur is taken into the body through what we eat. This happens to be the methionine content of various foods, which is one of the primary sources of sulfur. There are only two, cysteine and, and methionine. For the same amount of calories, for the same uh, amount of food, beef has four times more sulfur-containing amino acids than the pinto beans. Eggs has four times more than corn. Cheddar cheese has five times more than white potatoes. Have you ever heard of cutting the cheese? Chicken has seven times more than rice. Tuna has 12 times more than sweet potatoes. The sulfur gets into the body. Some of the sulfur may break down into the mouth and give you halitosis there. But most of it occurs this way. And my point being is you can even clean your mouth carefully and you'll still have halitosis, bad breath. Is the uh, meats are swallowed, they're broken down, the uh, sulfur is released to form hydro hydrogen sulfide. <clears throat> and this circulates through the body. Some of it stays in the gut, but much of it is picked up through the bloodstream and it goes to the skin and it gives you BO, body odor. And then some of it goes to the lungs and you outgas it, exhale, and that gives you bad breath, which cannot be fixed just by brushing your teeth or swallowing mouthwash. This sulfur still eludes as you talk and exhale. And then some of the hydrogen sulfide, it makes it all the way to the end of the intestinal tract where you make stinky gas, bad farts. Now people do notice on our diet, starch-based diet, that they do make more gas, but it's just natural. I mean, when you eat that kind of diet, like horses do, you get lots of gas. But what I do say in our defense is that our gas smells better. Their gas smells like something died. And it did. There was an article just published I found interesting. <clears throat> uh, it is uh, whether or not what somebody eats affects their body odor. They took 17 male donors and they tested them for two weeks on a meat or non-meat diet. What they did is they took uh, uh, pads and they soaked up the uh, the water out from the armpits of these men on different kinds of diets. 33 women were used as judges. They would have to smell the arm pads. This is a blinded study. You know, they didn't know which man was eating which diet. And 33 women, women found male donors on the non-meat diet were judged as significantly more attractive, more pleasant, and less intense. It really does make a, mad, make a difference in what you eat as to how attractive you're going to be to people who are close to you and people you work with and people who you have intimate reproductive relationships with, potentially or at the time. All right, so that is my discussion on attractiveness. We have you back there. Gustavo? Very good, yes. Uh, we, we saw it all. Very powerful, especially so the, the video. So, you know, uh, people are, are out there trying to make themselves more attractive to everybody. You know, it's just our nature. We want to be attractive to, you know, people of the same sex, opposite sex, uh, workers, uh, students, et cetera. And they say to themselves, how am I going to make myself attractive? Well, I'll get a nose job. That ain't going to do it. Or I'll get, I'll get myself a, a new Tesla car or some pretty new clothes, or something that hides all my fat, or buy, buy some new makeup. Uh, they're missing the real point on how to become attractive. <clears throat> Health is attractive. You know, I, I, I tell this story, uh, usually in my lectures, uh, about attractiveness, and most, mostly in terms of visual attractiveness, because you don't notice the odor attractiveness until you get real close to people. But it's a big deal, and you know it is. 
I tell the story about how my dad and I, one day we were walking down the street, looking at the scenery, checking out all the scenery. And my dad had seen me look over to the left and get a big smile on my face and he'd see me look over to the right and a little foot of frown and then they take a look at another girl in front of me with a big smile. And he'd say, Dad, my dad say, son, <clears throat> you find, find that girl over there attractive, don't you? And I said, yeah, Dad. You don't like that one very much, do you? And I said, no, Dad. He says, do you know why? And I said, why, Dad? He says, because that woman is, is healthy looking. That's why you're attracted to her. And that one looks unhealthy. And I said, Dad, that's not what I was looking at. He says, son, yes, you were. You just didn't realize it. And now at the age I am, I realize that's what it is. It is the way you, that health, healthfulness you convey and the way you look and smell. And those things are easy to change just by changing the food. All right. I, I'd love to ask some questions. Very right. good. Yes. Well, you know, you mentioned earlier a little bit about oil. And of course, the question about coconut oil and flax seed oil somehow being miracle healthy oils comes up and it has come up would you just say what i think you're going to say <laughs> yes it's it's oil it's uh the fat you eat is the fat you wear on and under your skin uh it is not a food you're not dealing with food you have left behind the protein vitamins minerals phytochemicals all you're dealing with is an isolated concentrated nutrient at best it could be a medicine but at worst, it's a serious poison. It's one of the two categories of food poison that I tell people to get away well, away from. The first category of food poison is uh, animal foods, all animal foods. And the second category of food poison is oils. And you say, well, that's all I eat. All I eat is animal foods and oils. Well, excuse me, what you're going to do is you're going to substitute those energy sources for clean energy. And the clean energy is starch, rice, corn, potatoes, beans, peas, lentils, with some fruits and vegetables. That's all you, what, you, what you're going to do. Right, right. Uh, and, so and, and, low weather. Yeah, sure. well, I was just going to say that's that's been the world's problem, uh, particularly in Asia. Uh, we, we've seen it over the last 35 years. <clears throat> uh, some of the countries like China and India, they just reported in the British Medical Journal that obesity in the middle class in India has risen to tremendous proportions, epidemic proportions. It was only the rich people in India before that were obese, but now it's the middle class. and. And China, people are becoming terribly, terribly obese. And what happens, you can measure it. I've got it in some of my newsletter charts, is the amount of meat and the amount of oil has doubled in these countries in the last 10, 20, 30 years. It's doubled. And the result is obesity and diabetes. It's, not, it's just not confined to Canada, Australia, and, and the United States, these health problems of excess. Now it's every, every place. Right, it's every place, and uh, you mentioned my own, you mentioned my home country, Argentina, earlier. So. Yeah, no, that's that's one place I have to tell you. Now that you mentioned it, Gustavo, that's one place I thought I was going to have to give up and go on the Atkins diet. I, I say you can go almost every place in the world and get, find good food. Uh, I, I, I was pretty frustrated. Argentina was. I don't know how it is today, or I just looked in the wrong places. But it was hard to eat when I was there. It is. It is frustrating. I just also went to, to France, to Paris, and it, it was almost impossible. Uh, I just think that when someone goes to another country like that, you just have to rent an apartment and cook yourself. Yeah. Or find out um, what they do have local, you know, like breads. I, I did well in uh, France on breads, and, and in Germany I lived on sauerkraut and potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I could find. Sauerkraut and potatoes. Exactly. And, um, that's it. Yes, and uh, oatmeal. That's that's what I eat most of the time. Um, somebody's talking, asking about um, avocados, and you know, when you talk about the fat you eat is the fat you wear. I think you're talking about more like refined oils, uh, or are you talking about everything nuts and avocados, yeah. everything? Yeah, yeah all, all those things. Uh, that's how you get the fat vegan. Is they uh, dine on avocados and nuts and seeds. They could even be raw fooders. They you know, could dine on nuts and seeds and avocados, and then then the other part of their diet is sugar, which is fruit fruit juice, all raw, no cooked. And uh, it's healthier than the American diet, but you're still going to be a fat vegan. <laughs> I'm just sorry. Right. I didn't right. make the rules. Exactly. 
so but some people that are not that are have reached their their weight and you know it's would you say that it's okay if every now and then they have an avocado or some nuts yes uh, i, I think it's fine these, yeah. these are health foods these are not unhealthy oh. foods they were de designed by nature but they're they're rich packages to support the seed you know to support support growth for the new year for the plant and so they happen to be just engorged with fat and the that fat's purpose is to get the seedling uh, up into a plant where it can get plenty of sunshine and so it's stored dense energy for the plant's reproduction that's what nuts and seeds and avocados are for and uh, some doctors that recommend like a, a um a tablespoon of gr of ground flax seed every day. What would you what what do you say about that? Well, what they're trying to do is they're trying to make sure that they people get enough omega three, good omega three fats, so to say, speak. And uh, ground is not much processing from the flax seed. We use flax seed to help people with their bowel movements when they're at the program. When you grind the fat flax seed, you remove you release more of the oil, so they get more omega three fats. If you take the, all the other stuff away and just have flaxseed oil, then it's really toxic. Uh, first of all, people do not need to have added flaxseed. And you say, well, they're on the American diet. Wouldn't that help? I don't know. I mean, if you're eating a low omega-3 fat diet, I don't know what's going on in your mouth. And I certainly know the solution is not to take concentrated omega-3 fats. If you eat like I recommend, uh, then you're eating tons of omega-3 fats. You don't need any more, any more. And they're all in perfect balance. Only plants can desaturate at the carbon-3 position. So only plants can make omega-3 fats. No fish makes omega-3 fat. No cow makes omega-3 fat. Only plants do, and they make it in the proper proportion for good health. You know, potatoes are not a mistake, even though they're 1% fat. And corn's not a mistake, even though it's 9% fat. And, uh, you know, the fats in that food naturally, and it's mixed up with other ingredients, other phytochemicals, vitamins, minerals, and so on, in proper proportions, so that when you eat the fat, it goes into the cells uh, at the right timing, on the right amount. Nature does not make mistakes, and you don't have to go add some extra ground up flaxseed to make things better. You'll end up with greasier skin, and maybe more acne, and gain some weight, because you've, you've broken up that shell. Right, right. It's the package. What matters? Well, yeah. Thank you for for pointing it out, uh, Doctor Matugal. A very very interesting question. Um, have you revised your plan over the years? And if so, how have you revised it? Well, we wrote our first book, I think, in 1977. It was a uh, uh, with a ring binder so that we could add more recipes. It was called Heal and Stay Healthy. It wasn't called. Uh, no, it wasn't. That wasn't the name. It wasn't called Heal and Stay Healthy. It was called Making the Change. Uh, we took that title purposefully, Making the Change, because we knew that was the problem. I mean, if you did this, you would always heal and stay healthy. But we, we kind of balanced off those ideas. And so we called it uh, Making the Change. And it was a ringed notebook. Got up to about 99 pages. And the diet was a starch-based diet with the addition of fruits and vegetables. And then the McDougal plan came along. It was the same thing. It taught a starch-based diet with the addition of fruits and vegetables. By the time we got to uh, the McDougal program for maximum weight loss, we started focusing more on the higher, the richer foods like uh, dried fruits and juices and <clears throat> nuts and seeds and avocados and warning the diet. You see, I, I never wanted to be known as a diet doctor. I always wanted to, I'm just a general doctor. I just take care of people with diabetes and stuff. But I kept getting pushed into being a diet doctor. And finally, I wrote a book, I think it was uh, probably 1984, called The McDougall Program for Maximum Weight Loss. That was just, you know, because people wanted to know, well, I just wanted to know how to lose weight a little faster, a little, you know, a little easier. So I write this book. So I wrote the book. It was over 20 years ago, probably 21 years ago now. <clears throat> and it was with uh, Penguin which became Penguin Putnam, Putnam, which is now, oh, I don't know, they've taken on Dutton. I think Dutton was added to it. And that book has been a top seller for that many years. Never backlisted, never taken off. Uh, some of my books have, uh, they, they felt that they've uh, done all the good they're gonna good do, and they gave me back the ownership of the books. And that, not that book, they're never gonna give back the ownership of that book. So that's all, uh, I think the other thing about, <clears throat> 
No, I never, ever, I never recommended a lot of exercise. I never recommended that you think good thoughts. Uh, I just reckon it's just food. I recommend food, go for a walk and get some sunshine. And I've always recommended B12. That's always been a recommendation in every book I've written. And that's so I wouldn't get any criticism because, you know, you can't criticize my approach based on calcium deficiency, protein deficiency, amino acid deficiency, any vitamin deficiency. But if you search real hard and, uh, you know, take a casual look at the research, not a careful look, but a casual look at the research, you can come up with um, a few people who have developed a disease from lack of B12. In most cases, there's something else going on. Maybe, maybe you can find 10 cases. Well, I didn't want to add to the 11th case, nor did I want to have people focus attention on B12. So from the beginning, I just told people to take five micrograms of B12 a day. What you need is five tenths of a microgram. What you can't buy is fewer than 500 micrograms, and you get pills that contain as many as 5,000 micrograms. So I think if you take a, a 500 microgram oral B12 pill every week or every month, you're gonna be fine. Yeah. And, and by the way, Mary and I do take B12 when we remember. I think it's about time to remember. It's probably been a couple of months since we did, but it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a worthwhile recommendation. We wouldn't make it if it wasn't. I take it every Thursday, actually, before, <laughs> right, before right, the right, webinar. Webinar. <laughs> But McDougal's on, let's get the B12 in there. Oh, yes, I want to look attractive, too. <laughs> Um, well, so one time, more every time I do, do comment, Gustavo. Every time I comment, it's it's kind of like, and we have this record from previous webinars over the last six months. We ought to just uh, you ought to just take some snapshots of you as time has gone on and put them up for people on the webinar to see just how much change has happened in your personal appearance and the seventy plus pounds you've lost. We, I might do that then. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Dr. McDougall, we have been here almost an hour. And okay. so I know that you're busy and uh, we'll let you uh, go. And um, I know you want to wish everybody happy holidays. Oh, very much so. I, I hope you have good times with your family. There's uh, holiday recipes, by the way, up on the website. Uh, just look, you so you know, you'll learn how to make mashed potatoes and a stuffed pumpkin and the way that Mary's going to. Well, she's not actually going to even go that, on that theme this year for Christmas. We're going over to Heather's house, and we're going to have a, a, a noodle dish, uh, one of our favorite noodle, noodle dishes. That'll be our Christmas celebration. Not even close to anything oh. that would resemble a bird. So the family's going to get together and have uh, dinner at Heather's. Yeah, I do want to wish you happy holidays and a good new year. Our next 10-day uh, program is in January, and we're going to uh, we're going to go to Hawaii January 30th, and we invite you to that. The advanced study weekend is really full. It's going to sell out. Remember, T. Colin Campbell's going to be there, and Esselstyn, and Gregor, and a lot of the favorites, and a lot of new people, too. So if you call up uh, the beginning of January, and Heather has to tell you, I'm sorry, we have no more room, don't be surprised, because it's really filling up a lot. And uh, You can watch it uh, from, you can yeah, watch you, it right live. You, that's right. You can, uh, we, we'll be uh, selling it for an internet broadcast. Uh, close to the time of the real show, which is February 12th through 14th. Yeah, I don't know what else I want to tell you. That was fun. That's going to be fun showing those videos. And uh, it is. Yeah, a lot of people, uh, you, I, I am always amazed how many people comment. You know, we love your website, but how many separately make a big deal about, boy, do we love the webinar? And uh, we love the webinar too. We're having fun at it. <laughs> We do, and I, I I see people commenting that they like the to have the weekly McDougal doses. Uh, <laughs> the McDougal fix, huh? <laughs> see, if, yeah. see, see if he's still alive and well. <laughs> it's his turn. All right. I want to see if he's still there. But we are going to have some guests uh, uh, next month also. But I'll be doing the bulk of the webinars. Uh, and uh, but we want to bring in some more of our team to have you see some very interesting talent. That would be really nice. That would be very nice. Thank you. Well, everybody, I know that uh, the the, the uh, latest newsletter has a lot of really good recipes, and so I would encourage everybody to go to the website, drmcdougall.com, and download it. And the the, the first part, the, 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 the attractiveness part is already up. It's right. the November newsletter you read there. And also, we've had some questions about 
the replay on the webinar. Sometimes it takes a while for us to get this webinar up on the website. And so when you go to the website or you get an email that says uh, you can now watch this uh, webinar again, share with your friends, et cetera, uh, and it doesn't appear to be there, well, just be patient. It'll be there. Sometimes it takes our team a little while to get it up. Yeah, it may. It sometimes it just takes uh, 24 hours, but it's yeah. usually less than that. It is. All right. With a lot of hard work from well, a lot of good people. <laughs> yeah, it, it you know it does take uh, several people to put these webinars together, and uh, we appreciate the work that everybody does. Yeah. Um, I want to also thank everybody for logging in, and uh, I look forward to um, seeing you, Dr. McDougall, and everybody else the first week of January. Very good. Thank and, you. Uh, happy holidays. Happy holidays. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye.